Yeah, so, and I made a video. Um, so, here we go. and girls, and it's time for another exciting installment of our favorite hero, Adam Smith. So sit back, relax, and let's learn about him. Our story begins with Adam Smith being born at Kirkcaldy, Fife, Scotland. His mother was named Margaret Douglas, and his father was also named Adam Smith. Although the exact date of his birth is unknown, his baptism has been recorded on June 5, 1723. Although little is known about Adam Smith's early life, there has been one recorded event of him being abducted by gypsies and being held for ransom until he was finally rescued at the age of four. Now, Adam Smith was very smart as a young boy, and at the age of 14, he entered the University of Glasgow to study moral philosophy. It was here that he started to become interested in liberty, reasoning, and free speech. Now, Smith would later use these three ideas to come up with a theory of economics. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is economics? Well, it's basically how people behave and what they're interested in. But we'll get back to his economic ideas later. For now, why don't we just continue with his early life? While Smith was at Glasgow, he was also greatly influenced by one of his teachers named Francis Hutcheson. He was widely considered one of the greatest teachers and public lecturers of his time, and he would greatly influence Smith and his later writings. After graduating from Glasgow University, Adam Smith received this award called the Snell Exhibition, which allowed him to study at Oxford for free. Unfortunately, Adam did not like Oxford as much as he liked Glasgow University. The reason why is because he wrote about how the teaching staff did not encourage him to learn as much as they did at Glasgow. Adam even wrote about one time in which he was reading a controversial book of the time period and he was caught by several members of the teaching staff at Oxford. He was punished severely for it and this is one of the primary reasons why he didn't like Oxford. Smith disliked Oxford so much that he left before his scholarship ran out. He then decided to start writing down public speeches and delivering them to people. Now, Smith wasn't very good at speaking publicly, but his lectures were so successful that he met with very famous people, such as his, one of his best friends, David Hume. Now, David Hume was about ten years older than Adam Smith, but they shared common interests, such as history, politics, philosophy, economics, and religion. Since they were both so interested in the same subjects, they became really good friends, and they started to write speeches together to deliver. In 1751, Adam became a professor at Glasgow University, where he had previously graduated. He began to teach logic courses, and in 1752, he was elected a member of the Philosophical Society of Edinburgh. However, the year after he joined, the head of the society passed away, and Smith took over his position. For the next 13 years of his life, Adam worked harder than he ever had on his work and his economic theories. He said that these years were the most useful and happiest of his entire life. Then in 1762, Smith earned the title of Doctor of Laws from the University of Glasgow. And by the end of 1763, he got an offer from a man named Charles Townsend to tutor his stepson, Henry Scott. Now, Henry Scott happened to be the young Duke of Buccleuch. Now, this job would pay Smith almost double what he was already making at his teaching job in Glasgow, so he accepted. And he also attempted to return the fees he had collected from his students because he left in the middle of the term. But his students thought so highly of him that they refused to accept it. Now, it was part of Adam Smith's job as a tutor of Henry Scott to follow him and his family along on a tour of Europe. The first stop on this tour of Europe was in Toulouse, France, where they stayed for one and a half years. Now, according to Smith himself, he found Toulouse to be quite boring, and he wrote to David Hume that he had begun to write a book to pass away the time. After touring Toulouse, the group moved to Geneva, where Smith met the philosopher Voltaire. From Geneva, the party moved to Paris. Here, Smith came to know several great intellectual leaders at the time, invariably having an effect on his future works. This list included Benjamin Franklin, Turgot, Joan de Allenberg, André Morellet, Helvetius, and most notably, Francois Quesnay, head of the physiocratic school of thought. Now, once again, you may be asking yourself, what is a physiocracy? Well, it's basically another economic theory that states that the majority of a nation's money comes from how well it can develop its land.
So from this, we can tell that farmers are very important for a physiocracy. And the physiocrats were very against this system called mercantilism, which was one of the most widely used systems at the time period. Now, what is mercantilism? Well, it's basically another economic theory that states that the government needs to control all trade with other people in order for the country to be successful. The physiocrats didn't like this so much that their motto was even laissez-faire et laissez-passer, le monde va de l'humain, which stands for let do and let pass, the world goes on by itself. But let's get back to his early life. In 1766, Henry Scott's younger brother died in Paris, and Smith's tour as a tutor ended shortly after that. Smith returned home that year to Kirkcaldy, Scotland, and he devoted much of the next ten years of his life to his largest work, which would be called The Wealth of Nations. And now, I promise I won't start talking about The Wealth of Nations. I'll continue with Smith's life. So when Smith made it back to Scotland, he became friends with a young man named Henry Moyes, who happened to be blind, but was very smart, just like Smith. So aside from teaching Henry Moyes on the side, Smith became a member of many different societies, which I will now list off. In May 1773, Smith was elected a member of the Royal Society of London, and was elected a member of the Literary Club in 1775. Then in 1778, he was appointed as Commissioner of Customs in Scotland, and went to live with his mother in Panmer House in Edinburgh's Cannon Gate. And then, five years later, he became one of the founding members of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and from 1787 to 1789, he held the position of Lord Rector of the University of Glasgow. And you know what? Despite all this, on his deathbed, Smith was disappointed that he hadn't accomplished more. <laughs> Overachievers, what are you going to do about them? Anyway, getting back to his most important work, The Wealth of Nations. Now, The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776, and it was an instant success. It sold out its first edition in only six months. The full title of the book is actually called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, but it's typically shortened to The Wealth of Nations. Now, The Wealth of Nations is a very complicated book, and there have been many editions of it that were published both during and after Smith's lifetime. Now, one of the biggest ideas that Adam Smith tries to tell us through this book is that man is selfish, and that he is generally only looking out for himself as opposed to others. Now, normally this selfishness would be considered a bad thing, right? However, Adam Smith tells us that it's possible for this selfishness to become a good thing. For example, he says if a man works hard in a society in order to benefit himself, that hard work will actually have a good effect on the society itself, not just the man. So he kind of, the man accidentally helps out the society while he only intends to help out himself. Now, it was with this idea that Adam came up with this idea of a free market. Now, a free market is basically a competitive market where all the prices are determined by the people selling the goods. And they determine these prices based on the supply of the good and how badly people want the good. So from this, we can tell that a free market is run by competing interests. So an example of this would be if I'm on the street and I see a guy selling newspapers for 50 cents each, and I pay him 50 cents for the newspaper, there is a benefit for both of us in this transaction. I want to read the news, and he wants money. So we both gain from this, and we both profit off of our self-interests. Now, remember when I said that Adam Smith would meet a lot of people in Europe that would influence his writings? Well, the physiocrats definitely played a big part in this. Remember, the physiocrats believed in this laissez-faire form of economics, which basically meant that they didn't think the government should have very much to do with the economic part of the state. Adam Smith incorporated this physiocratic way of thinking into his theory because he pretty much believed that the government should only be limited to taxing its citizens. So we can tell from this that Adam Smith definitely believed in the same type of laissez-faire economics that the physiocrats did. Well, now that I've sufficiently bored each and every one of you by going over Adam's life and his works, why don't we move on to what school of philosophical thought that he focused on? Well, we can definitely tell that Adam Smith focused heavily on ethics, which is basically what is right and wrong and how we do it, because he wrote an entire book on it called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. We can also tell that he focuses heavily on economic structure more than anything else, because he is, after all, considered the father of capitalism. One could also say that Adam Smith focuses on metaphysics as well because of his frequent references to human nature in his books. 
Well, I hope this educational episode of The Adventures of Adam Smith has helped you to better understand the man himself and his theories. Tune in next week for our educational documentary on Karl Marx.